Welcome to the 68th episode of Delika, a podcast between two friends about the latest in society, politics, and feminism in Indonesia and the world. I'm Stephanie Tangkalisan. And I'm Sweden Lee. And this is our first episode after the elections, so we are very excited to share our feelings and our thoughts about the recent elections and its results and democracy in Indonesia in general. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about the legislative elections as well and about Stephanie's documentary as well. You should listen to that at the end. Yes, I... <laughs> Also, watch her documentary because I got shit for it. Anyways, here's to it. So how was your experience voting in the embassy of uh, Indonesian embassy in DC? So I, I guess it's the same thing for you, right? Like it's 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 our first time voting overseas, and it seems yeah. much more of a party atmosphere. There was like a big food bazaar afterwards. You know, after you voted, yeah, you got like a discount coupon to get like your you know sate, batago, or things like that, and and that's so nice. <laughs> It was so great. I was just like, if this is the only reason to go and vote, I mean, th- I'm down for this. And uh, with the DC one in particular, it's actually like for Virginia, Maryland, and DC, they all came to the embassy here. So it was like a big mm-hmm. party atmosphere. A lot of people drove out of state to come in and it was fun, you know, and the embassy itself. You know, was it full? Was it like packed? Oh, yeah. When I arrived, um, so voting he- here started at 10 o'clock in the morning. I got there at 11 and there was already a huge line. I waited for an hour. Yeah. About the same for me. Oh, yeah. So I voted in Kajet in New York, the Indonesian consulate in New York. And similarly, it's like like four or five states that votes in the same Kajeri. Mm-hmm. I think it polls open for ours at around at 10 as well. And they came at like 10 and it was like already a line because I had an mm-hmm. assi- photo assignment afterwards. Um, and yeah, so when I get there, it was like a line around the block and everyone was like, it wasn't as party. We didn't really get any food. <laughs> you didn't get any food. <laughs> didn't get any food. We still had our pinky dipped in ink though, which I really appreciated. It's like such an Indonesian election like thing. I know. It didn't feel complete without the pinky dip in the ink. It was kind of nice, right? Because, you know, I think for... It's familiar, right? Like... Yeah, for people... At home. <laughs> who lived abroad for a long time, you know. When else do you get to just hang out with a shit ton of Indonesians? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless you're, like, at college or something, right? Like, this doesn't really happen that often. And so it was kind of just nice. I know. Like, I was meeting my Indonesian friend uh, the day before. One of the very few Indonesian friends I have in, in New York. And then it was, like, most people our age, like, she's, she's like, in her 30s. Um mm-hmm. Most people our age are in Indonesia right now. So, like, <laughs> the majority of Indonesians who are still here and are older is just, like... People who've moved here, probably, right? It's, like, also who've also, like, established their own group of friends. And, like, mm-hmm. and it's, you mm-hmm. know, it's just in our college times, so or even when you're 22, 23, if you're in the U.S., you have a lot of Indonesian friends. And then, like... Now it's like, oh, I don't want to hang out with college kids. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, we like grew out of that phase. Um, I thought you want to at least with the DC area. There's a lot of families here. I think you know a lot of people obviously work with the embassy. So yeah, there was a lot of families. Yeah, and it was actually really nice. Like when I was lining up behind me was like a 19 year old who was like, this is her first election, and even though. I could tell from her, like her accent and what she was talking about with her with her um, siblings that she was probably born here and raised here. Aww. She still is going to vote in her first election, and that was really cool. You know, she was like here on her own with her siblings mm-hmm. and getting ready to vote. Uh, so it was pretty fun. You know, it's like it was very endearing. And I think living in the states for so at least for me, right? Like living and working in the states, I sometimes take it for granted, like yeah, the, the sheer act of voting. And I think. For Indonesia, like, we're still a young democracy. We're still trying to get it together, right? We're still trying to figure things out. And it just reminded me not to take for granted the ability and the privilege to vote.
Warga Indonesia yang tinggal di Belanda tampak begitu antusias memberikan suara di pemilu 2019. Mereka rela mengantre di suhu hampir 0 derajat di KBRI di Den Haag. Namun tak hanya memberikan suara, momen pemilu juga dijadikan sebagai ajang silaturahim dan kesempatan untuk menikmati aneka masakan khas Indonesia. Pemungutan suara dibuka sejak pukul 9 pagi dan berakhir pada pukul 19 waktu setempat. Antusias juga ditunjukkan warga Indonesia yang tinggal di Kanada. Mereka datang ke KBRI di kota Vancouver untuk bisa memberikan suara. Antrian bahkan mencapai luar gedung kedutaan besar Republik Indonesia di sana. Warga Indonesia yang tinggal di Roma juga tak ketinggalan memberikan suara mereka. Warga memberikan suara di KBRI Roma di tengah suasana santai dan mendengarkan musik. Bahkan beberapa warga bergembira dengan menari bersama. It's been two weeks since the elections. You know, we we decided not to do an episode during the week of elections because I guess the thing we wanted to talk about would still be in the early stages, anyways. <laughs> and now, yeah, and, and given how the election went, <laughs> uh, I think it turned out to be a good thing to not discuss it right away. Yeah, I mean, like um, two exactly. We're two weeks out, and we're still we're still counting, um, and we'll still be counting until like the end of May. But it looks like. Uh, Jokowi and Maruf Amin have a unassailable lead of more than 10%. And it's like around, um, they won the popular vote by around 10 million. The popular vote! <laughs> you know that thing? America. <laughs> that should decide elections. Um, but yes, I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, still petty about it. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, we should be. I will always be petty until Trump is out of office. Anyways, back to the Indonesian presidential elections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Joko and Maruf have, uh, as of uh, this week, as of recording, 56.2% according to the KPU, the um, General Elections Commission, while Prabowo and Sandy has 43.8%. Yeah. So I don't think Prabowo is going to make it. <laughs> Even though, even though he claims victory, right? <laughs> right. So Prabowo has been claiming to have uh, won the election and that there has been systematic cheating of votes and that the election was robbed, essentially. And this sounds decidedly like 2014. <laughs> yeah, except that I feel like he's been building a case uh, for stolen votes much longer this time, mm. like even before um, the election itself. I mean, I think, you know, even just like early surveys and, and polling before the election itself, there was always, you know, this is not a surprising result, right? A lot of people have yeah. predicted that Jokowi would win and Jokowi would win by a, well, not necessarily like a landslide, but certainly enough. Um, so I think Prabowo, I mean, I'd like to think he was in that delusional to think that he would just win it outright. But who knows? <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, as as we said, uh, the official vote will not be announced until the twenty second of May, because we have over, I think, based on uh based on the research I did, we have about like a hundred fifty million votes that are being counted. I mean, also shout out to Indonesians who like went out and vote. I we know, have a real, pretty good voter turnout. A almost eighty percent. You know, for comparison, the twenty sixteen presidential elections in America. Which a lot of people are like, oh, this is, you know, this country is the country that celebrates democracy and voting the most. It was only 56%. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I applaud Indonesia and all Indonesians all across the world um, for going out to vote. And major props to all Indonesians for voting. Thank you for voting. And even those who might have voted with a golput or a protest vote, you know. Mm -hmm. You certainly have your reasons, and I respect your reasons. Um, and I think voting is such a privilege, and it's also a civic duty that if you can do it to show your voice, whatever your preference and your voices, then you should, because otherwise mm -hmm. our leaders will not hear or will not know what's going on uh, amongst its constituents. So yeah, that's my piece. Um, I'm very proud of our young democracy and because i feel like indonesian elections are such a celebration right like it is it's, i feel like it's a very different vibe from like american elections where yes. it's like the serious thing and like and it's not on a holiday like 
our elections I are know. always like made a national holiday mm-hmm. or are taking place or like weekend, <laughs> which I feel like is the way it should be. Like it, it's an occasion, and I yeah. it boggles my mind that America doesn't have uh, election day as a national holiday, and you wonder why turnout is so bad. Um, <laughs> Speaking of, you know, this is all well and good, but also like almost 300 uh, Indonesian election workers died and, you know, making sure this election happened. Um, I mean, you know, when I was uh, reading up on this again, it's, it's staggering, right? Like close to 150 million people voted mm-hmm. and six million, six to seven million people were employed to count all those paper ballots in, you know, manually. Yeah. And I was reading somewhere, you know, um, in, if you're in Indonesia, you get up to five ballot papers because you're, you know, not only choosing presidential, you're choosing legislative and like your regional leaders, mm-hmm. right? So. Yeah. And these are big, heavy papers. So part yes. of the death was also because of like pure exhaustion because, um, Indonesian election commission takes great efforts to make sure that voting is available to the far reaches of the country. And there are really mm-hmm. remote islands and places that requires like a six hour hike to get yeah. to um which is i don't know like just carrying that much ballots it's just, it's just you know prone to accident but that's still really a high number i don't understand how how that can happen in such a way i think you know uh this is obviously the first time indonesia's ever conducted both the presidential and the legislative elections together yeah and i think that was uh, it's double the load, right? It was double the load. I th- and then they probably hired the same amount of people. So they're like... Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's interesting, right? Because I think they did this because they wanted to save money and also like to conduct everything all at the same time so that there's less instances of corruption or like mm-hmm. uh, voter fraud or anything like that. But I don't think anybody anticipated just the sheer yeah. work yeah. that is needed to process all of these. And like you said... There are some places where you literally have to, you know, ride a boat for like a couple of hours to get to the villages in the most remote parts of Indonesia. Where where are archipelago? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and outside of like maybe Java, we don't necessarily have the best infrastructure to do all of these things manually, right? Yeah. Um, it just it just goes to show there's still so much room to there's still so much room to improve our voting system and. I, I kind of get it because obviously in the most remote parts, you don't have internet. You barely have electricity in some of these regions. So you can't necessarily do like an online or like an electronic voting system. Yeah. But that's, that's a lot of paper and a lot of man hours. And, and you know, it's, it's tragic to hear that um, not only have, you know, more than 300 people died, but like in the thousands have also fallen sick uh, because of exhaustion. I mean, like, I think it with better proper far more proper equipment and training that should be mm-hmm, mm-hmm. much better handled or and or avoided you know oh I'm like sure. i feel like this is a failure in planning you know like i feel like people have been like oh my god it's so heroic and they're heroes etc i'm like yeah but they're still dead they shouldn't have and to be right? like i don't I, I i feel like i'm somewhat uncomfortable with like like oh these are the true heroes whereas like i feel like we should be like okay how was this plan that led to people dying yeah like and like i totally agree that these people should be respected and held up as people who are protecting our democracy and yeah somewhere in the back of my mind like the fact that they died made me feel a lot more uncomfortable with people saying the election was stolen oh yeah yeah um but at the same time like i feel like the election commission should be scrutinized more for how they plan this event and how they're going to prevent this from happening again. Yeah. Like, this must be a systemic failure. And I feel like that should be investigated. If only we knew an Indonesian journalist. (laughs) (laughs) We'll talk to a few people. Um, But, you know, yeah, I mean, I was reading somewhere that 
part of the part of tragic part of this is that a lot of these workers feel very strongly about reaching the far out villages, right? Yeah. Because they know that if 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 they don't show up, if they don't do their job properly, none of these villagers would be prepared or well equipped to vote. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially since some of them don't even have the internet to be informed about what's going on and what's the issue. So they really rely on the election workers to prepare them. And to sometimes even like just talk about the issues and and stay informed. So it's really they're at the front lines of literally maintaining one of the most basic rights of democracy. And this it is I like like you said the election commission should be scrutinized. And like how did they screw this up? Yeah. So badly, like three hundred people and thousands of people fallen sick is not an insignificant number. <laughs> That's not a fluke. Nope. <laughs> that said, it's been a it's been a it's been the end of a. Not too bad of an election campaign cycle, I guess. Yeah. You know, looking back at it. Yeah, like it's not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. I think we were all like prepared for for the worst. <laughs> yeah. But overall, I think... Look at us being so skeptical. <laughs> uh, with our flimsy but earnest logic. I think overall, though, it's it's gone fairly as planned. Even the legislative elections, like the usual suspects are... In, or back in mm-hmm. the parliament. There hasn't been any pretty much fundamental change. Yeah, there's no like, you know... <laughs> Except Nasdem won a lot of seats. Uh, oh, yeah. And unfortunately, our friend Michael Victor Siani uh, party did not make the parliamentary threshold, although they did mm-hmm. gain a few, quite a few seats in the local uh, legislative branches. Yeah, but I see, uh, which is amazing, actually. I was looking it up, you know. They've, we've got three parties, at least. That were there are new parties that weren't there in 2014, right? Yeah. Like PSI, uh, Partai Perindo, and Partai Berkarya. Granted, those last two are not, uh, shall we say, pro-liberal mm-hmm. <laughs> with their ideology. Yeah. But we've got new parties trying to challenge the existing order of like the usual suspects of like PDP, Golkar, and etc. So it it gives me a little bit of hope that we're not just gonna rely on the usual parties, and the usual parties can't just do whatever they've been doing for the last um, decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's always next time, right? Like, I've, I've heard a lot of people, um, people our age, I think, were disappointed that parties like PSE didn't make it into the national parliament. But it's, it's they're still young. They're only, what, four or five years old. They're still next time. Mm-hmm. And it, maybe it's a good idea to, like, build locally first and expand. Nothing... Teaches you more about how to better your party than losing yeah. <laughs> in an election, to be honest. And I mean, um, like, I'm pretty sure they have better candidates than the candidates who actually won. Yeah, of course. But, you know. Um, yeah, obviously, still a lot of issues with with democracy here. and But hey, I think it's, it's slow steps, like baby steps. But I think we're, I think we're moving in a strong... Positive direction. Hopefully, I think... <laughs> Yeah. What I've discovered, you know, I think, and maybe you'll agree with me, with us both being outside of the I Indian. don't agree. <laughs> that rarely happens. Uh, with, uh, with us both being outside of Indonesia is that, obviously, the Indonesian diaspora is huge and multifaceted. Yeah, it's and huge. And they, they, they all crave this sort of information as well. They want to know what's going on with Indonesia. They're not just like, oh, we left, and then we don't care about the country anymore. Yeah. And that's what I found resonated so much when I was uh, at the embassy, when I was voting. It's like everybody here, there are some people here who have obviously moved here like maybe in the 80s or 90s, mm-hmm. set up families here, right? Oh, wow. And have generations of families here, but they still want to participate. They still want to vote. They still want to feel part of the country of their birth, even though they're no longer there. And I, I just found that so like heartwarming uh-huh. because... You can take it for granted that, like, when you've moved out, when you've emigrated outside of your country, that you sort of like cut ties with that. But it was just so nice to to see everybody still care so much, and it's like it's also great. Like, and we're all like touched by the same things. It's just like, oh my god, Indonesian food, Indonesian <laughs> music, Indonesian jokes. It's just like we're all still like this is what makes our country and our culture like so meaningful. <laughs> I will say this, you know, I think when we started this podcast three years ago, oh, I can't imagine, I certainly wasn't imagining us 
talking about the 2019 elections. Yeah. Certainly did not imagine us to have the following we have and you know the support we have. So just just on beh- on behalf of Stephanie and myself, thank you guys so much for listening to us. And good but- night. I'm kidding. Uh, and I hope you guys still will listen to us because, you know, even though the election is over, we still have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, we still have a lot of... And I will hopefully not have my pollen allergies again. Uh, we hope that Stephanie will not be sick. <laughs> because So, uh, uh, listeners, if you um, can't tell by my nasally voice, I'm particularly <laughs> more nasally than usual... Um, no one has complained about my vocal fry, though. So yeah, that's good. Yay to our audience being more woke. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I have this thing called pollen allergies, which I didn't realize was a thing until my third year of college in the, in the U.S. Basically, I'm allergic to trees having sex with each other. Um, yep, that's that's a very so scientific way of emit, describing like, it. <laughs> tree germs um, that like make my eyes water, make me sneeze, and I have a little bit of hives, like a little bit. So I've been hashtag struggle blessing. Also, I'm very tired because of my previous events. So yeah, actually, you know, I think uh, I think our listeners want to hear. I'm a published author in the U.S. now. Yay. Yeah, I, our listeners want to hear about this. Like, what happened over the weekend? I mean, we kind of already talked about it a little bit, but come on. Yeah. So the documentary that I've been working on, see, baby, baby journal. Um. So the piece that I've been working on for a really long time was finally published this past. Thursday and um, we had two screenings in one in CUNY Law School and one in uh, Bronx Defenders, a nonprofit organization, um, legal defense organization in the Bronx for a community screening. So um, The Intercept acquired the film and what's the uh, name of the film? Trouble Finds You and you can YouTube it Trouble Finds oh, just search for The Intercept it's the latest video they have so um, it's also we have a website TroubleFindsYouFilm.com and Instagram trouble find, at Trouble Finds You Film and uh, yeah my, my Twitter crashed like I had a lot of retweets yeah, that's fantastic and, like tags hannah dryer tweeted me she's the, the this year's pulitzer winning journalist and i was just wow. like what, what i fell out of my chair <laughs> and she like yeah my, oh my goodness God. that's amazing and then a lot of people started following me and i got really confused but yeah now so, you got now you gotta keep it up <laughs> yeah i mean i'm already working on a couple new stories but yeah that's, that's my what's next for trouble finds you is there what are, are the next plans uh we're gonna do a couple of more screenings and we're trying to like find a way to get it on tv um for more stuff um uh, craig was interviewed my ma- ma- main That's character amazing. for the story uh, was interviewed by wnyc this morning yeah um yes and um it's going really well like i feel like um nobody hates me yet which i find really surprising <laughs> yet yet is the key word <laughs> Yeah. Well, con- congrats on it. I think. I, uh, I feel like if our listeners have been followed. Have you watched it? Have you even watched it? So I watched I- it on Instagram. <laughs> you watched the first minute. Yeah. Well, I didn't know it was on YouTube. I thought wow. it was like, oh, do you have to go to the screenings? I'm not in New York. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you can YouTube it. So I-, uh, I will do my best to support you. Such a betrayal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, our listeners will obviously link to Stephanie's documentary um, on our show page and everything. We'll share it with it. Yeah. Uh, well, listeners, you know it's it's been a while since we just had an episode where we just talked, and I hope uh, you enjoyed that. You know, I think it's always nice to just decompress and yeah. kind of like talk our feelings out. And we'll be back uh, in two weeks with a brand new episode and a brand new topic. Probably, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can find more information and resources of whatever we talked about on our website, delica.id. Music credits to John Dealey, Lee Rosever, and of course, Broke for Free. If you like what you hear and want to support us, please review our podcast on the Apple Podcast app or whatever app you use to listen to your podcast. 
And please share our podcast with your friends. It's the best way to spread the word about Dialogica. If you want to get more involved, we'd love to hear from you. Our email is dialogicapodcast at gmail.com or just shoot us a message on our Facebook page. You can also find us on Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, and our Twitter. Please follow us in these various platforms. Our Twitter handle is at dialogicapod. Also, follow me on Twitter. It's Steph Tank. That's S-T-E-P-H-T-A-N-G-K. Thank you again and see you guys next time. Bye!